we're told that we have to defend the Constitution. But wasn't it the Constitution? Wasn't the Constitution the thing that was supposed to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty? Wasn't that what the Constitution was supposed to do? Isn't that what the preamble of the Constitution specifically states that it is uh, written to do? That's the case. And yet, when we put these myths aside, the Constitution was actually written by a small group of elites to fool the commoners into believing that their new federal government would be held down and kept small and weak. The Constitution was literally written by a group of lawyers, bankers, and land schemers. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. It was not who you think it was. It was not these mystical founding fathers who were so so good and they only did good things. That's all a lie of history. The conservative myth of America is based on a pretend history that never happened. Think about the think about those faces on Mount Rushmore. People people look at Mount Rushmore and they get a warm, fuzzy feeling and they think, Oh, look at that. Those great men up there on that on that mountain, look at those faces. Oh, they were such great men. Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Jefferson. Let's just think about these four guys. George Washington never cut down his father's cherry tree. Did you know that? That is entirely a lie. George Washington, his father died when he was a baby. He probably had no memory whatsoever of his father ever living. This was a lie that was made up to get people to think George Washington was this great and honest man to get him elected as president. Do you know the the process that Washington used to get elected in the very first presidential election in America? Well, it just so happens that Washington also owned, in addition to other things, he also owned uh, the the largest whiskey distillery in the, in the new states, in, in the former colonies. He was the largest whiskey producer in, in the United States at the time of his election. And did you know that the way that he got elected was he sent barrels of whiskey out to the polling places. And if you showed up and voted for George Washington, you would get a mug of whiskey. Now, that's not something I just made up. That's a very well-known historical fact. It's easy to check it out for yourself. George Washington bought the first presidential election by giving out free whiskey. And then once he got to be president, once he once he secured that, that spot as president, the very first thing pretty much that he did was get the whiskey uh, tax passed, which brought more tax on the people than they had ever seen from the British, way more than they had ever seen from the British. And it just so happens that here's the guy who's the largest whiskey producer in the country pushing a whiskey tax, and he also got to decide how much the tax was and how it was uh, how it was distributed, how it was not distributed, but how it was collected. So he got to decide how his own whiskey company was taxed and how his competitors were taxed. That's what George Washington did in his very first presidency. And you know, he didn't have a standing army. It was actually, it's against the Constitution to have a standing army. It's right in there. So Washington bought the first ele- election with whiskey. Then Washington used his power and his influence as president to get his competitors taxed unfairly and to not get taxed as bad himself. Now, when the the situation started to turn bad when uh when regular people didn't want to pay the the whiskey tax but washington had no army to do anything about this situation and he didn't have the power within congress and within his presidency to to have an army to go and enforce this tax so you know what washington did washington sent a, a small group of of mostly militia but he sent a small group of, of men to invade Ohio, which had never been a part of Amer- of the U.S. It had ne- Ohio was Indian territory going all the way back to the French and Indian War. He had no Washington had no right to invade Ohio, but Washington sent men in anyway. He sent a small, uh, very weak body of uh, soldiers 
to attack a very strong Indian stronghold. And they got butchered. The soldiers got butchered. And then Washington went to Congress and said, like so many presidents after him, look, guys, we're already at war. We're at war with these Indians. They've attacked us and killed our men. And he used that as an excuse so that Congress could, under an emergency, give him the ability to have a standing army. So then he got his standing army. What did he do? Did he go into Ohio and avenge the deaths of all those soldiers? Did he take care of, of Little Turtle and the other, the other Indians in Ohio with, the, with his new army? No. He invaded Pennsylvania and killed American citizens who were fighting against his whiskey tax. That's what he did. After he went to Congress and said, I need an army so that I can battle the Indians in the Northwest, that's what Ohio was considered then. And they gave him the army to do that with, and instead of going and facing the Indians, he went and just killed the Appalachians in Pennsylvania. That's what George Washington did. And now his face is on Mount Rushmore, and we hear lies about him like, oh, he's so honest. No, he was not honest. He was a politician who bought his way into his position. The United States has been run by aristocrats based on heraldry since the days of George Washington. This was made clear in the founding documents of the Society of the Cincinnati, which was based on the idea that George Washington was the founder and father of this country and would be uh, proclaimed as such. The Society of the Cincinnati was an organization put together by Washington's officers to make sure that they got control of the fledgling new nation, and they did it. They did it through a military coup when they took over Congress with military presence and forced a vote to accept the Constitution as the founding document of the federal government. The Constitution was never intended to restrain government. The Constitution was a con job from day one. It was the result of a military coup executed by a small group of elites made up of Washington's officers and their financial supporters who were almost all bankers and land speculators. I've done other podcasts where I actually name these guys' names, and you can look them up for yourself. And you can go back and find my other podcasts on this topic where I actually go through and name the people who were at the Constitutional Convention. They are not the same people who were who declared independence. They were a completely different people than, than signed the Declaration of Independence. We're talking about a whole different group of people backed by Washington's personal guard. Now, let me tell you about some land schemes. I mentioned land speculators and I mentioned some uh, some land schemes before. Let me go into specifics. I want to tell you about two land schemes that were taking place around the time of the f of the forming of the new United States government. So here's the first land scheme I want to describe. Um, during the actual war of independence, Washington forced poor farmers to stay in the army under threat of execution. So first they would go out and they would convince somebody to join the army so that you can so we can have liberty, we can fight off these British and we can we can own our own property and not be taxed by these nasty British and and we can you know we we'll be the ones who tell us how to live. We're not going to let those people in, in in England tell us how to live. So so people signed up, signed into the army. And they would they would sign up for like 6 months, right? Or or a year. Well, when that commission was out, Washington would not let them leave under threat of execution, and he did execute some. Under threat of execution, he forced those poor farmers to stay in the army. And during that time, Congress refused to pay the soldiers until they were so starved and weak that they literally couldn't fight. They couldn't fight the British, and they also couldn't fight Washington and his, and his guards. Now think about this a little bit. So all these farmers, so we were told, you know, as kids growing up and with school and everything, oh, Washington was this great general. No, he didn't. Washington spent almost the entire war retreating, running away from the British, avoiding a battle, because he knew he couldn't stand up to the British in battle. He knew his, his, his troops were not strong enough. They were starving. They were literally starving. And he kept them in that position. Congress didn't pay him. He didn't feed him. 
but if they tried to go back to their farms, he'd shoot them. Now, while these guys were in the army, Congress decided that it was okay for the individual states to start taxing land. Now, they, the people, the landowners in the colonies under England never paid land taxes. They never paid property taxes. But now, all of a sudden, the new states introduced these land taxes, these property taxes. And the tax had to be paid in either gold or silver. This is when Congress was issuing script to the soldiers. Congress, when, when Congress finally did pay the soldiers, it was in this worthless script. It was not in gold and silver. So the soldiers couldn't even take the script and go pay their land taxes. The soldiers, um, the soldiers were not allowed to go home and work their fields, so they couldn't make money that way. And they couldn't pay their land taxes with, uh, with the script. And they couldn't leave the army. And so, eventually, state governments ended up taking the poor farmers' land. A lot of it. This is what the uh, Shays' Rebellion was about. Now, um, so the bankers come through, and the bankers start buying the script off of the, off the Continental soldiers. Uh, but they're buying it at pennies to the dollar. So, uh, and not even that. It's, at times, it was even worse than that. So, the bankers are buying up all this worthless script, Right? And that's kind of keeping the rebellion down because at least now the soldiers are getting some money. After the war, uh, after Washington, that coup that I was talking about where Washington is, and his officers took control of the Continental Congress and then pushed through the Constitution, formed the federal government, then the federal government has the ability to tax, which they did right away, and the federal government then starts buying the script from the bankers using money, using gold and silver. So the bankers are able to take all this worthless script that they bought for almost nothing and sell it to the U.S. government for gold and silver. And then the bankers and the land speculators that are in on this buy up all the farmland from the states and then start selling it back to the farmers at a profit. Now that was a land scheme that was taking place. And that's to a certain extent what Shays' Rebellion was about. And, and this, is, this is not necessarily, Washington wasn't necessarily profiting by that itself. But he was there and he was a part of it and his men were profiting from it, his officers. But here's an earlier land scheme that Washington was a part of. Before the War of Independence, George Washington and his business partners illegally surveyed and mapped what is now called Ohio. At the time, Ohio was not a part of the colonies. England released all interests in Ohio after the French and Indian War. With agreement between the King of England and the King of France, Ohio belonged to the Indian tribes. And was and therefore the the French could go in there and set up. They weren't supposed to set up forts, but they could set up settlements where they could trade with the Indians and so forth. That was part of the settlement to the French and Indian War. So Ohio was not a part of the U.S. when the U.S. defeated uh, Great Britain and won their independence. Ohio was not a part of that. But once the war was over, remember Washington's got it all surveyed and mapped. Once the war is over. Washington was in control of the federal government after the coup, and he sent the army into Ohio for himself and his business partners to secure that land from the Indians. You see, he had a vested interest not only in the Whiskey Rebellion and in using American soldiers to, to quiet the Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania. He also had land speculation schemes for Ohio, and he used federal troops to go into Ohio and defeat the Indians and push them into Indiana because George Washington had already surveyed it all out and took uh, uh, ownership of the land and divided it up between him and his, and his officers that he had to pay for, uh, for the coup. To, that, was their, that was their earnings for being a part of that coup that took over and pushed the Constitution into place. Washington paid them in land from Ohio or in gold that he made off of the land. And just to push the point through, the United States government was a con from day one. It was orchestrated by Washington and his officers and their banker allies. And it was uh, the, it, the intent uh, was to keep the aristocrats in power. And people like Hamilton actually said this openly. Hamilton referred to himself regularly as an aristocrat and said regularly that it was the job of the aristocrats 
to control the poor people because they're dumb anyway. The the non aristocrats they they they're like children and and you know it's the job of the aristocrats to take care of them and that's the the thinking that these people had then and now. Back in the day, many of the people who we consider or the folks say today are the founding fathers. A lot of those people were very much against this Constitution. If you've never heard of the anti-federalists or the anti-federalist papers. That's what I'm talking about. There were some of the most prominent people of the day were against the Constitution because they saw what it was. They saw the con that it was. They saw that it was based on Washington's personal guard and his military threats against Americans. That's why the Constitution got passed, because Washington threatened with it. And so some of the people, like Henry, uh, Richard Henry Lee, uh, sent a letter to George Mason. Mason, uh, try that again. Richard Henry Lee sent a letter to George Mason on October 1st, 1787, and he called the Constitution, and this is a quote, the deviousness of Congress's action. Samuel Bryan, October 5th, 1787, called the Constitution a most daring attempt to establish a despotic aristocracy. And he said that it was written for, and this is a direct quote, the interests of the well-born few. William Findlay, November 6, 1787, called the writers of the Constitution a set, this is a quote, a set of aspiring despots who will make us all their slaves, end quote. Thomas Jefferson, in a letter to William Stephen Smith, dated November 13, 1787, wrote the famous phrase, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. You know what, folks? You've been lied to. You've been had. You've heard that phrase. You've seen it on T-shirts. You've seen it on Gadsden flags. But do you know that that is not in reference to the British crown? Do you know that he said that after the War of Independence? The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. He said that in reference to George Washington and the other Federalists. Let that sink in for a moment, Constitutionalist. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Thomas Jefferson referring to the Federalists. Hamilton, Washington, Madison. Think about that. John Adams. That's who he was talking about. He was not talking about the King of England. He was not talking about the British. Are you ever told that in school? Were you ever told that? Did you see that on, on some TV show, on some patriotic movie? Did they point that out? Did they ever point out that Jefferson, when he said that a little revolution now and then is a good thing, was talking about killing Federalists? Did you know that? He was not talking about the British. He was talking about extending the War of Independence so that people could be independent of the Federalists. George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, those guys. George Mason, in his Objections to the Constitution, dated November 22, 1787, said that America under the Constitution would be a, quote, corrupt, oppressive, aristocracy. That's George Mason's words. Patrick Henry, you might have heard of him. Patrick Henry said to the Virginia Ratifying Convention in June of 1788, and this is a direct quote, they will not reason with you about the effect of this Constitution. They will not take the opinion of this committee concerning its operation. They will construe it as they please. And Patrick Henry was right. That's exactly what they have done for some 230 years. They have construed it as they please. Patrick Henry also said, Show me that age and country where the rights and liberties of the people were placed on the sole chance of their rulers being good men without a, without a consequent loss of liberty. 
at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Patrick Henry made the same argument that economist Hans Hermann Hoppe has pointed out, namely that a caretaker government will always loot the country, whereas an ownership government can often preserve the wealth of a country. Now, what does that mean? You have um, you have a, a rich guy, and he owns two different hotels, and he dies, and so he leaves one directly to his nephew. the The hotel now belongs to that nephew. The other one. Um, he leaves to his nephew to take care of, but after a certain amount of years, the the, the hotel and the property are supposed to then go to uh, a, a charity that the uncle picks out. Okay, so so one nephew is the owner of the of a hotel. The other nephew is a caretaker of the hotel. Now he can make as much money as he wants during that time frame, but at the end of it, he has to turn it over to somebody else. And so you look at this situation, you say, okay, so how are these two men, one owning a hotel, the other being a caretaker of the, of the hotel, how are they going to treat this? How are they going to treat their stewardship over this? Well, the owner of the hotel, it's his, so he has a vested interest in making sure that it's successful. And if he can make money off of it and improve it, he can actually make more money and he'll have something to give to his family when he passes on. So he has this great incentive to take care of it, to improve it, and to pass it on. But the caretaker nephew does not have that incentive. His only incentive is to get as much out of it as he can and therefore, um, and, and at the end, turn it over to the charity. And then because of that, therefore, he will loot it of all of its value. So we have we project ahead 20 years and look at the two hotels. One has been cared for, improved, advertised, and 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 is a, a really good functioning hotel. The other one is ready to be turned over to the charity. And what does the guy do with it? Well, he ran it into the ground. He didn't do any repairs. He got as much out of it as he could. And at the end, somehow it got set on fire, and he collected the insurance money out of it. And then he gave the, the bare lot to the charity. And that's what his motivation would have driven him to do. So that's the difference in a caretaker government and an ownership government. So so what Patrick Henry was saying, much like what Hans Hermann Hoppe was saying, is, look, you guys jumped out of this situation with the King of England, and now you're going to set up a caretaker government. It's going to be worse than what you had before. He warned them of this. He, he, he told them right out, you're going to end up paying, you fought against taxes, you're going to end up paying more taxes than you can imagine. That's what he's saying to them, because that's what a caretaker government will do. If you go over to Wikipedia and you read uh, for what the Federalists were and what the Anti-Federalists were, the Federalist Papers are a series of, eight, this is from Wiki, the Federalist Papers are a series of 85 articles and essays written, written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, promoting the ratification of the United States Constitution. And also from Wiki, the Anti-Federalist Papers are a collection of articles written in opposition to the ratification of the 1787 United States Constitution. Unlike the Federalist Papers written in support of the Constitution, the authors of these articles, mostly operating under pen names, were not engaged in a strictly organized project. The anti-federal, okay, and so that's uh, an end of quote at Wiki. The anti-federals had to keep their identity a secret because uh, because of the violent nature of the federalists. They wanted to live. I've read before from a, a letter that George Washington sent to uh, Richard Henry Lee, and in it he makes a veiled threat to Lee, which essentially was like he was kind of it was kind of like. Uh, you know, in organized crime, you have situations where somebody says something like, "Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a real nice business you got here. I'd hate to see anything happen to it." Know what I'm saying? You got a, you got a real nice family there. You got a real nice family, real pretty wife. I'd hate to see anything happen to her. Now, this is the kind of language that people understand. And George Washington's letter to Richard Henry Lee reads exactly like that. It's in reference to the Shea Rebellion, in which Richard Henry Lee had kind of expressed, you know, um, well, I don't like that, but I certainly understand why it's happening. 
and maybe we need maybe it needs to spread some and this was also you know what I mentioned before Thomas Jefferson had said that well a little rebellion is good now and then you know the tree of liberty needs a little uh, watering from now from time to time and George Washington put these veiled threats to these anti-federalists and said essentially you know I have my own army and you need to either be a part of us and profit from it or you need to shut up because you don't want to see me mad that's kind of what Washington said to them the federalists in Philadelphia this the they didn't call themselves that at the time but they were essentially that uh, hung Quakers and took their homes and took their land and exiled some to Virginia uh, kicked them out of Pennsylvania kicked them out of Philadelphia they hung Quakers in the town square and it was mostly because they uh, uh, the Quakers were opposed to these uh, to the centralized government that these guys were wanting to push on everyone and they were unwilling to fight the British uh, they, they wanted to be left in peace. They, this war, this fight, was not their fight, and they, you know, they were pacifists by their religion. So the answer was uh, to hang them, and that's the the kind of activity that that's the way these guys um, got into power. It's the way they stay in power. According to old English tradition, a man's house was his castle, and and the government literally could not come through the door. This is all new. This is not how it used to be. This is what we've got since the a federal government took over in the United States. And, you know, you often see these conservatives and these uh, right-wingers uh, quoting the Federalist Papers in support of the Constitution, why we need the Constitution, why the Constitution is, is going to save us and all this kind of thing. Well, quoting the Federalist Papers in defense of the Constitution is like is like asking a used car salesman if the car that he's selling you is good. Of course he's going to tell you it's good. Uh, don't ask a Chevy dealer about a new Honda. Don't trust what the Chevy dealer has to say about the Hondas. Don't trust the buy here, pay here used car dealer when he tells you that, the, that this car was owned by a little old lady who only drove it to church on Sundays. Would, would you spend your money buying something from somebody like that and just trusting them on their word? Well, when you trust what's written in the Federalist Papers, you're trusting uh, the exact guys who were pushing the con at the time. It's very much reading the Federalist Papers and accept, accepting the words of guys like uh, Hamilton and Madison. It's exactly like trusting a used car salesman, except it's far worse because the used car salesman is not going to uh, have the SWAT team kick in your doors, take your cattle, shoot your children like the federal government does, burn your children like the federal government does. When you're giving away your, your freedom, be skeptical about it. And when you trust the Constitution, you're giving away your freedom. You're saying that your rights come from a piece of paper. You're saying that your rights can be defended by a piece of paper. You're saying that people in government are going to obey a piece of paper. But you know what? You didn't sign that paper, and no one living signed that paper. And it's not it's a contract, but it's not a binding contract, because no one living signed it, and no one living agreed to it. It is useless, but it's worse than useless. It makes you think it's doing something. It makes you think it's bringing you safety. But it, in fact, is a tool of your slavery. It is a sign of the chains that bind your ankles.